I need your help later. Just, thanks. Nothing like telling them the last second. Go ahead and turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 21. We're in Matthew 21, verses 18 and 19 this morning. Thanks, everyone, for participating in music. It's always important uh, to recognize that here at Baptist Temple, you know, I get to get up and preach, and Pastor Steve and George, but there's a lot of people who work behind the scenes out throughout the entire week to get it to where we can come up today and preach God's word. So for those who are ushers and greeters and work in the Welcome Center and Sound Booth and, and Sunday School teachers, the list can go on and on and on and on. I just want to stop to always say I appreciate everyone who serves here at Baptist Temple. Uh, I believe your ministry is vital here, and so if you're serving, keep serving. If you're not serving, get serving, and God can use anyone. But excited about our section of scripture we have this morning, and so let's pray, and then we're just going to dive right into God's word. Father, we come this morning. We are, of course, the thankful people for what Jesus has done for us. And Lord, as we come to study your word, uh, we give this service to you, Lord. It's your church. It's your word. It's your house. And so help us, Lord. Help me uh, just to bring the right words this morning. I ask that you would give me the correct words to speak, that I, we would interpret this scripture, Lord, that is pleasing to you and glorifying to your son. I pray you give the congregation the ears to hear. If there's someone here that does not know Jesus as their Savior, I pray that uh, your word would speak to their hearts and see their need for salvation. That's in Jesus alone. If there's Christians that are away from you, maybe we're not living our lives pleasing to you, I pray that this message would speak to their hearts, and we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew 21, 18 and 19. Our theme here at Baptist Temple, I like to say, is a simple one. We want to be like a tree that is mentioned in Psalm chapter 1. We want to grow deep, we want to grow up, and we want to grow out. We want to grow deep in our knowledge and understanding of the scripture that is God's word. We want to grow up, becoming more mature Christians, using our gifts to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And we want to grow out, bearing fruit and sharing our faith. But we realize for a tree to bear fruit, it must first have good roots. In Isaiah chapter 37 and verse 31, our theme kind of at the church is this scripture. Take root downward and bear fruit upward. As I was preparing the message this week and asking God, you know, what type of message should I bring about bearing fruit? Uh, I came across Matthew chapter 1 and verses 18 and 19. And we read this in, in, in the scriptures. Now in the morning, as he, that's Jesus, returned to the city, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and he found nothing on it but leaves. And he said to it, let no fruit grow on you ever again. And immediately the fig tree withered away and it died. Jesus is returning from the city of Jerusalem. It's early in the morning. He's hungry. And on the way, you know how it is when you're hungry, right? You've been traveling on the highway. You start checking out those signs, right? Oh, no Chick-fil-A there. And keep on going, man. And you're just kind of looking for the right restaurant that you want. But you start to get hungry. You spot that restaurant, man. You pull off. And there's this horrible feeling when you're starving and you get to the restaurant and you get to Chick-fil-A and you realize, oh, it's Sunday. What's wrong with these Christians, man? Don't they know that I'm hungry? But there's that feeling like, oh, no, I'm starving. So you know what it's like when you're really hungry. Man, you go into the fridge, you're just looking for anything. Jesus is hungry. He is starving. He's heading back to Jerusalem. And on his way, he spots a fig tree. Fig trees are very common in that, in that area of the land, in that place of the world. They grow up high. They can be up to 20 feet high. They can be equally wide. And usually what happens is when fig tree starts to, to bear leaves, they also bear fruit at the same time. And so when Jesus, as he's hungry and as he's walking by, his, his stomach's rumbling, he sees the fig tree off in the distance, and it has green leaves on it, so he assumes that, that there must be fruit. And as he gets to the tree... We find, it's, the scripture says this, that he finds nothing on it, but there's leaves and there's no fruit. This tree, man, it looks so good from the distance. It was tall, it was big, it had bright green leaves, it had uh, stretching out branches, and I'm sure Jesus thought, that tree looks so good, it must have some fruit on it, but the Bible is clear. When he gets there, he realizes it looks good from a distance, but upon further examination, basically what I got, I got leaves, but I got no fruit. It looks good, but it's produced nothing. 
And as I read that myself, I, I came to this conclusion. I don't want that for my Christianity. I don't want to just look good in Christianity and bear no fruit. I don't want to just show up to church and have a nice, wear, wear nice clothes and look good. Walk in the church and got my Bible, man, look, looks good. I get in my car, I listen to Christian radio, I have Christian friends, and uh, we hang out together, and that looks good. And Man, I'll even show up at a couple church activities here and there, and, and that looks good. And listen, I realize this, it's easy to make our way through Christianity if we want and just look good from a distance, to play the part, to fill the role, to go through the motions, to just do whatever we want, to feel obligated to do. And, and people look at our lives from a distance, and they go, wow, they're pretty good. Man, they look good. They go to church. They got the Bible. I don't hear them yelling. I don't, I don't, have, I don't, I don't hear them cursing. And, and, and here's the deal. I don't want that to be my Christian life, just looking good. I want this. I, I want my life not only, of course, to look good to the Lord Jesus Christ, but every Christian has to ask themselves this question. Am I bearing fruit in my life? Because that's the purpose of the fig tree, is it not? It's not just to have pretty branches and leaves. It's to bear fruit. And I don't want to make my way through this Christian life, being, you know, coming to church and doing these things, and then get to the end and realize this. I was just leaves with no fruit on it. I just looked good from a distance. But when God got up close to me, I had nothing really produced. No, I want my Christian life, listen, I'd rather have a tree that don't look so hot that produces fruit than a tree that looks great and produces nothing. And that's kind of feel, you know, I may not look so hot, I may not have the brightest green leaves, but man, I want to do something for the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to produce something in my life for the Savior. When Jesus approaches this, this, this tree, he is hungry, and when he walks away from this tree, you know what he is? Hungry. Because the tree produced nothing. There is a world out there that is starving spiritually. Do you know that? There is a spiritual hunger out there to a lost and dying world. And let it never be said that they came to temple or they came and met you or they came and met me and they left still hungry because we were just a church with leaves and no fruit. And as I studied this out, I thought, you know, what type of fruit should we produce in our lives? What type of fruit should we be bearing as, as Christians? What type of fruit should we be producing? And I came up this morning, if you want to fill in your outline, that this four, fill in your bulletin in your outline, there's four types of fruit I believe that every Christian needs to be producing in their lives. Fruit number one is this, is the fruit of our words. In the book of Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15, we read this verse. Therefore, by him, Jesus, let us continually offer a sacrifice of praise unto God, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Now, the book of Hebrews was obviously written to the Hebrew people, the Jewish people. And the Jewish people knew very well what it was like to offer a sacrifice. Under the Old Testament system, you can read through the book of Leviticus and, and check out the scriptures, they would offer animal sacrifices for their sins. They would offer it at the temple, or first the tabernacle, then the temple, on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, and they would slay an animal, and the high priest would offer it for the sins of the people. So the people of, of the Jewish people, they knew very well what it was like to offer a sacrifice. But Jesus Christ came. The Bible says he was perfect. He was a, he was a lamb. He was a sacrifice for us. And when Jesus Christ died on the cross... He died for your sins and mine and paid the ultimate sacrifice so that we could go to heaven one day. And so now when I come to God, I do not offer an animal sacrifice to pay for my sins. I offer a sacrifice of praise because my sins have been forgiven and they have been paid for. One of the things that we can do as Christians is this. It's not hard. It's not complicated. The fruit of our lips can give thanks to his name. And that, the Bible says, is bearing fruit. I began to think about that for a minute. You know, what, what are we thankful for? And, and our next slide says this, thank you, Jesus, for, and you, blank, just blank. And so if I had to ask you this morning, I'm going to ask Pastor Steve really quick. You don't have to do it. It could be a shorter sermon if you don't. I mean, whatever you want to do. Want to get out early? We could do it that way. But what are you thankful for? Is there anyone who has just a word this morning? It doesn't have to be long and don't want the whole life. <laughs> But just, man, God's done this in my life, and I just want to say 
thank you, Jesus, for blank. Fill it out how you want. It's your life. It's what he's done for you. I'm just, I'm, I'm so thankful for the way that God provides every one of my needs, yeah. everything. Just, um, I have wonderful health. I just, I just thank him for his love and, and how he cares for me. But my God shall supply all of our needs. Absolutely, yes. In his glory, in Christ Jesus. Man, has not God provided for us? I'm thankful for a godly husband. What an example he's been for me for the last 40 years. I'm just thankful for that. Thank you, Jesus, for your husband. 40 years. Congratulations. Debbie, next one. We're still being alive after a heart attack, seven stints, all my health issues. Um, I'm like an energizer bunny. I just keep on going, so I'm thankful that I must still have a purpose here. Yeah. The Bible says, n teach us to number our days, because every day is a blessing and, and a gift from God. Every day is important. Every day counts. Thank you, Jesus, for the life that we have. I just want to know, I just want you to know, after a year and a half, I'm still here. Uh, God chose to uh, grant a miracle in my life. And I thank you all for praying. Thank you, Jesus. Watching over. I'm thankful for my salvation and my husband's still alive. Yep. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for our sins. He's um, blessed me in a lot of ways. And I'm thankful today for everything he does for me. But I just want to specifically say that I'm thankful for my daughter right here and for Thank having her in my life. And um, the fact that she's a Christian and got saved here. Yeah. So I'm thankful for her today. Thank you, Jesus, for our kids and they know the Savior. Just a couple more and then we'll, I don't want to stop. But I, I used to pray to live to see my children grown. God has blessed me to live to see great-grandchildren grown. This morning, I am so excited. My 13-year-old great-granddaughter, Emma Hutchins, is in Spain competing in world competition. She represents Canada. Yesterday, they got the bronze. We're hoping today she, they'll get the gold. But what a great blessing this is. Yes, ma'am. I don't have grandkids, but from what I've heard from you guys, I uh, have them first. They're such a blessing, right? That's, that's, that's what I hear. I thank him for who he is and what he is. Yeah. And I couldn't do without him for one second in my life. Amen. You know, when you stop to think about it, all of the great things that God has done for us through his son, Jesus Christ, and what we have opportunity to do not just once in a while like we do here, is that we have opportunities through our days to just stop and to give a sacrifice of praise unto God, which is the fruit of our lips giving praise to his name. And, and I say this kind of to myself as I was studying this. Sometimes as a pastor, you, you, you preach a sermon, but it really kind of speaks to you first. And I thought, how many days go by where I never stop and do that? Do days turn into weeks? Do weeks turn into months sometimes? Do we not thankful for the food that we have, the car that we drive, the house that we live in? You know, you start to list all the things that you're thankful for. Man, how can we not go through a day without stopping and just saying, thank you, Jesus, for, and you can just fill in the blank yourself. Thank you, Pastor Steve. He told me he didn't get enough exercise yesterday, and so we have him running around today. So what I want to say is this, that every day that goes by, you want to produce fruit in your life? Let me tell you a good, easy way to start. Thank you, Jesus, for a wife, or your husband, or your kids, or your food, or your job, or just, it doesn't have to always be a big thing. Sometimes it's just the small things that Jesus just blesses you with. But let it never be said anymore that we went through a whole day that God has given us, and we never stopped to say thank you, Jesus, for something that he brings in our life. One of the things I would love for us to, as a people at Baptist Temple 
to once in a while just stop and give praise to Jesus that the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name for all that he has done for us. You want to produce some fruit in your life? Praise Jesus. In 1 Thessalonians 5.18, we read this. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. In Ephesians chapter 5, chapter 5 and verse 20, it says, Give thanks always and for all things to God, for the Father and name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, if you put all these verses together, it's continually, it's in everything, it's in all things. Not just when it's good, but when it's bad. Not just when it's going your way, but when it's going sideways. Sometimes, I believe the fruit looks the best to God, not when we praise him when things are good, but we praise him when things are hard and difficult and in a storm. I believe when those times come and we could say, thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing even in this storm, I believe that looks like some pretty good fruit. But to go days, weeks, months without talking about how awesome God is and thank him for him, man, I don't want to be just leaves with no fruit. Every day we should be thankful. We, should, we have the fruit of our words. We also have, number two in your outline, we also have the fruit of our works. In the book of Titus chapter 3 and verse 14, we read this. And let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs that they may not be unfruitful. See, our words and our works must line up, right? If we just talked about how thankful we are to Jesus for all that he has done for us, that's what we just did, right? Then how cannot our actions line up with that? In other words, if we're going to thank him for what he has done for us, then how can we not go out and do for other people? If Jesus has blessed you, how can you not bless others? If he has been kind to you, how can you not be kind to others? And the way the scripture word is, I like it, it says we need to learn to maintain good works. It's something you learn. No one has to teach you to do nothing. You realize that? You don't wake up and say, all right, kids, you know what? I'm going to teach you today how to do nothing for, for, for no one. I'm going to teach you today how not to help someone. I'm going to teach you how to look the other way. No, no, those things come naturally, don't they? It's natural. It's our, it's our carnal nature to go through life and not help and to not do things and to go on our own path. We must learn, and that's what we teach our kids, right? Help other people. When you're entering, going through a, a building, what do you teach your kids as they open up that door? Hold it beside, hold it for the next person coming in, right? You know why you're teaching that? Because they just slam it right behind them, man. Because we have to learn to help other people. And so what the scripture says is this. What I want you to do is this. I want you to help other people throughout this life, and that way, at the end, you will not be unfruitful. And so helping people with your good works, going out of your way for other people, the Bible says that is producing fruit in your life. Going through and only helping yourself, that's unfruitful. You know, and I know it's, it, it, sometimes it's hard. You know, anyone, we're busy. I'm too busy. I'm too tired. I'm too poor. I don't have time. I don't have energy. I don't have resources, Joe. I, I don't think I, I can really go around my life helping other people. You know what I have found in life? When something is important to you, you find the time, you find the energy, and you find the resources to do that thing. If it means a lot to you, you tell me what you like to do, what you love to do, and I guarantee this, you got time, energy, and finances in that thing. And that's all right. But if people start meaning something to you, if ministry starts meaning something to you, then you will find the time and the energy and the finances to be involved in that. This isn't just for, for wealthy people. This isn't just for poor people. The Bible says this is for all of us. And when you stop and help someone and do something, Jesus is saying, God is saying, listen, that is being fruitful. You know, I'm thankful for the ministries that we have here. I'm proud of some of the things we do here at Baptist Temple. Do you realize that every week during Awana and during our, our youth that they feed all of the Awana kids? They feed all of the teenagers, and they even feed the pastor on occasion. Do you know that? On Wednesdays. That's a lot of time, energy, effort, and, and, and money. But why? Because we want to do good to people. I realize that some of you bring meals into homes after someone's been in the hospital. That's bearing fruit of your good works. Some of you people here are on the funeral. You, you help with funeral services. When people are grieving after the funeral, they can come back here to Baptist Temple and, and, and you put on a meal for the family so that it's just one less thing they have to worry about during a very hard day. That's fruit. We make mats for homeless people in the community and the surrounding areas. 
Do you know that sometimes we help some of our senior saints with projects in the homes? And, and I could stand here today and I can just list all of the things that, that we do that are fruitful ministry and helping people in a time of need. And it's not just limited to church ministries. This should also take place in your lives. As you're going through life and you see a need and you're able to meet that need, don't continue on with what you're doing. Stop. Help. Bear fruit. It's not just enough we talk about it. We have to do it. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 18, we read these words. Let us not love in word and in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Don't just talk about it, do something. In James chapter 2, chapter verse 15 and 16, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needful for the body, what is the profit? In other words, our talking about doing good things really isn't doing good things. We must go and do those good things. Talking in love, yeah, that's great, but talk in deed, too. Get going, get doing. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, I'll put this up there. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. It doesn't say let your light so shine so they can hear your good words. It, doesn't, it says light, let your light so shine so that they can see what? Your good works. And as you stop and do good and help people, It brings glory to Jesus Christ. So you want to bear fruit? Bear it with your words. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done for me. You want to bear fruit? Do it with your works. Jesus, now that you've done all this for me, let me help some other people. I also believe this. Number third in your outline is we can bear fruit with our wealth. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 15 through 17, we read this. Now you Philippians know, Paul is speaking to them, that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia... No church shared with me concerning the giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek a gift, but I seek fruit that may abound to your account. When the Apostle Paul writes to the Philippians, he mentions that they had given to his ministry more than just once. So the church at Philippi, they would send the Apostle Paul gifts and love offerings and finances to help Paul in the ministry. And so Paul writes them to let them know. He goes, listen, I want you to know, the the money that you gave me for the ministry, that money has been used well. That money has helped plant churches. That money has helped bear fruit. And Paul writes them to let them know, hey, listen, your gifts have mattered. Your finances have, have meant something. And I love what he says. He goes, I'm writing you not because I desire a gift. I'm writing you, don't don't think it's about Paul. I'm not writing so you give me more money. I'm writing so that fruit may abound to your account. Do you know that you have an account in heaven? It has your name on it. And your account in heaven, it works like this. As you invest in ministry down here, it is deposited up there. No one else can give to your account but you. I can't put money in your spiritual account. And you can't put money in my spiritual account. There is an account in heaven that God keeps track of, and as you give to the work of the ministry, as you give to people as they're sharing Christ and getting out there in the community, as those people are saved and lives are changed, Paul says, listen, that is fruit that abounds to your account. As you give your tithes and offerings here, even the Baptist temple, we use those finances and that money, we use it for ministry. And when ministry takes place here, that is fruit that abounds to your account. Do you know that when a teen gets saved, when a teenager trusts Jesus Christ as their Savior, you did not lead that teen to the Lord, most likely. But because you give to the ministries of Baptist temple here and you give to the Lord, we have Pastor Stephen, Amanda, and we have a youth group, and they do youth ministries, and as they are ministering to our teenagers and the teenager comes to know Christ as their Savior, those of you who give faithfully and cheerfully and generously to the Baptist temple, listen, I'm telling you, when you get to heaven, that is fruit that is abounding to your account. When when a missionary of ours starts a new church and people get saved and lives are changed, you may never meet that missionary. But as their lives are changed in that community and you give and we help support them, listen, I'm here to tell you, that is fruit that will abound to your account. And you don't know what's in your account while you're here on earth. You're giving it to God, and you're trusting God to invest it wisely and to use it, but it's accredited to you. 
Do you think, when it comes to here at Baptist Temple, I'll say this, you know what, I care how we spend God's money here. You say, well, I care what we spend it on. Because I want, and I don't mean this in a selfish way, I want the, the most fruit that can abound to your account and my account. So I want us to spend our money wisely on the things of God. I want us to spend it, when I pray and I ask God, hey, help us to spend this money wisely here. It's not a prayer I just pray right before we take our offering just to say some fancy words. I mean it and I pray it. God, help us to spend it wisely, to bear fruit that can be accredited to those at Baptist Temple account. I care how we spend it. I care what we do with it. I want to bear the most fruit possible. And when missionaries and people see people, because that is fruit that abounds to our account. Walt and Karen Troop, they are our missionaries to us, and I don't know if you remember that. They spoke here, I think it was about three or four months ago. They presented their ministry on a, on a Sunday night. They're going to come back eventually and take on a, on a whole Sunday night. Uh, they work at Nigeria at, a, I believe it's a place called Hope. Does anyone remember how many kids they have in the orphanage? Uh, anyone? I want to say it was like, is it like 60 or 80 kids in this orphanage? And so in Nigeria, they, they run an orphanage, and they take care of just a, a huge group of kids that have just been left, man. No one cares about them. No one watches over them. Nothing. And so we, we got a message that they, they don't have, like, you know, like you, you have, like, a light switch turning light. They have a generator. And so their generator uh, caught on fire. And when you, you notice um, when it catches on fire and that's your own elect, that's all they got. And so they're out in the middle of Nigeria. There's, there's, not, there's nothing out there. There's no power lines. They, they didn't call, you know, uh, uh, the Duke Energy and say, hey, listen, can you come fix my uh, lights here? <laughs> and so when they have no lights, they also have no water because their, their pumps down runs on electricity. And so, I, and I tell you this, just so this, do you, just because some of you don't know. And so we got news that their generator was down. They have no lights, they have no water. And, and so what we did is the deacons got together and we talked about it and we, we took money out of our missions fund and we sent it to them so that they could replace or repair their generator. And eventually they want to move to solar power. And we may, we may send them more money to, to help them do that. And the reason I put you is, well, you're just trying to make us all feel guilty. No, no, listen. What you give is between you and God. And I say this, and I hope you understand in the spirit uh, I say it, and I don't care. That's between you and God. What you choose to give, that's between you and your Savior. That, that, that's, God takes care of my needs, man. God takes care of our church. So I say this. I don't bring these things up that I seek a gift. I just seek fruit that abounds to your account, man. And you never, you're probably never going to meet these kids, right? Anyone got plane tickets to Nigeria? Coming on? No. You may never meet them. You may never run into them. I'll never meet that guy, never meet that guy. You go on their website, check it out. You're never going to meet any of those kids probably this side of glory. But I, but I tell you this, that is fruit that abounds to your account for those of you who have been giving cheerfully and generously and faithfully. And I, I don't know about you, that's money well spent, don't you think? That's money where I'm proud to say we help them out. You know, we have communion tonight. We, we do communion four times a year. And we take up, four times a year, we take up a special offering after communion. That offering we'll take tonight, and I mention it just as a reminder, that just goes to people in our church who are hurting and need help. And you know what? That's just money well spent. And as we give to missions, and as we reach out in our community, and as we help people get food and water and lights and, and meet basic needs and spiritual needs, I am here to tell you, according to Scripture, that is fruit that abounds to your account. When I get to heaven, it's just not going to matter the size of the house that I had, the car that I drove, or, or the clothes that I wore, and nothing wrong with poor, rich, big house, small house, nice car, junk, or regardless. But I'll tell you what, money that is just used for us in here, that is just, that is unfruitful. And I don't want to get to glory and be like, here's your account, <laughs> and it just reads zeros across the board, man. So I hope you give cheerfully and generously and faithfully because that money uses ministry and it produces fruit in your lives and your account. And so we have the fruit of our, our words. We have the fruit of our works. We have the fruit of our wealth. I personally love the sound of kids crying. And I mean that, I mean that seriously. I say just leave them here. 
and uh, leave them in this. And don't, I just think, to me, it's like the sound of life in the church. And to me, a, a, a child crying is just, to me, it's just a blessing. Bring them all back in. <laughs> Bring them all back in, man. We'll just keep talking, keep preaching. They can keep crying, man. That's how I look at it. It's just life in the church. I'm not kidding. It's a blessing. Children are a blessing. The fruit of our words, the fruit of our works, the fruit of our wealth, but I'll give you one more, the fruit of our witnessing. The Bible says in John chapter 15 and verse 6, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed that you should go and bear fruit. In Mark chapter 16, verse 15, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You know, as we go and preach the gospel, and we're telling people about Jesus, about his death, his burial, his resurrection, as you're witnessing the people about Jesus, that produces fruit in your life. You say, Joe, I never led anyone to the Lord. Listen, listen, it is not our job to save people. That's God's job. Our job is to tell people about Jesus. And if you are telling people about Jesus, and you're witnessing to people, listen, sometimes you may witness to them, and that plants the seed. Sometimes you may witness to them, and, 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 and they may get saved, and that's kind of like plucking the harvest. And sometimes you're the one in between, just kind of watering as, as it gets to that place. But it doesn't matter, because the one who plants, and the one who waters, and the one who, who collects the grain, they are all just equally important. So our goal isn't so much to be always the one at the end witnessing. Sometimes, listen, it's just telling people about Jesus. And as you tell people about Jesus, I don't care if you're planting the seed, watering, or collecting the crops, you are bearing fruit that abounds, I believe, to your account. You're, you're saying you're being a fruitful life. When Darcy and I were dating, uh, we were just, she was 18, I, I was 19, and I had just moved to Florida, and I had bought an, a Mustang. Now, there's two types of people who buy Mustangs. There are young kids who want to, you know, be cool, and then there are old people who want to look cool. Those are the two types of people who, who, who buy Mustangs. And, and, and so I was a young guy. I, I wanted to just kind of be cool and drive around my Mustang. And, uh, and then when I eventually get one one day, I'll be an old guy that just wants to look cool. So I, so, but this Mustang, it was just a piece of junk, man. <laughs> this thing would just break down no matter where I went. It looked good, <laughs> but it wasn't good. And so I was working at night at, at a gas station, Rally Gas Station on US 19 there. And I had kind of had the, the night shift, and as I was driving in, there was a McDonald's right before it, and so I just stopped at the McDonald's, going to grab Big Mac fries just before I, I, I headed off to work. So I go, I grab my Big Mac fries, things like that. I come back out, click, 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 this thing wouldn't start, man. So I do what all guys do when they don't know what's wrong. I just open up the hood. I'm praying spiritually that there's some wire that says, connect me over here, yeah. So if you go by and just see me with the hood up, that's just for show. I don't know what I am looking at, man. That's just the thing guys have to do, right? You know nothing about cars. Just open the hood, hit some stuff, look around, and, and so that's what we do. So I'm sitting there just looking at the stuff, eating my fries, mad at the Mustang, mad at the world. At this time, I, I don't know Jesus as my Savior. Uh, I'm not a Christian. And so I'm there about 15, 20 minutes, and finally a guy comes in. I'm just like 19 years old. He was old, like 30, something like that. So this dude pulls in, don't know his name, can't even tell you what he looked like, but, but he pulls in, and he pulls up next to me, he goes, you having trouble with your car? I said, yeah. He goes, listen, you're not going to believe this, but God told me to come in and talk to you. And I was sarcastic back then. I mean, I, I, I know you guys don't know me fully yet, but occasionally I may say things that, may, and I'm like, so I say, he said, God told me to stop and talk to you. I said, well, did God happen to mention to you what's wrong with my car while you're here? He said, yes. He said, can we pray together? I said, no. I said, I'll tell you what, man, you fix my car, and then I, I, I'll pray with you. And so he, he said, yeah, all right. So I, he goes, get in the car. I get in the car. Um, I don't know, listen, I don't know what was going on. Trunk was, the hood was up, and he shuts the hood, which, which to me, you know, shuts the hood. He goes, turn it over. Boom, the car started. I don't know if it was loose, bad. I don't know what it was, and I still don't know to this day. So he comes up to me and he says, okay, let's pray. And he went to hold my hands. I'm like, no, that wasn't part of the deal, man. <laughs> no, we just met. <laughs> Not holding no one's hand, man. 11 o'clock at night in a parking lot. <laughs> holding no one's hand. Just not going to do it. And she said, well, can, we, can we pray? I said, yeah, I agree to it. I'm a person of my word, and we pray. 
And so, you know what, I'd like to tell you up here that I had some super spiritual awakening. I remembered everything the guy said. That's just not the truth. I'm just thinking, get in my car, get my fries, get away from this guy. He's one of those Jesus people. I need to get away. And, and he prayed. And I remember some things about the prayer. I remember it was long. <laughs> and I remembered he talked about Jesus. And I remember the, you know, the basic starts. I think he was telling me about Jesus and salvation. I remember Jesus and dying and, and things like that. And, you know, and so he was done praying. He's like, amen. I'm like, all right, catch you later. And he went on his way and I, and I went on my way. And yeah, I, I'm just, I was spiritually blinded. I never thought twice about it. I went to work and, and, and never thought a thing. Here's what I want you to know. He has no idea about me. He has no idea I met a Christian girl. He has no idea I was stationed in Minot, North Dakota, next by Minot Baptist Church. He has no idea that I prayed to trust Jesus Christ as my Savior on 148 Waverly Way at Minot Air Force Base. He has no idea I was called into ministry. And he has no idea that I'm standing up here before you this morning telling you about Jesus. He doesn't know about the mission trips I've been on. He doesn't know about the people I've led to the Lord. He doesn't know about the people I've baptized or anything that God's ever seen fit to do in my life. He, he knows zero about that. And yet, when he gets to glory, anything God has ever seen fit to do in my life I believe that is fruit that it abounded to his account. Because that day he planted a seed about Jesus. He was just some guy riding by a McDonald's that God spoke to his heart and said, go talk to that, create, go talk to that kid about my son. And in one second, and I, I'm sure he thought, should I go by, should I keep going, because there's that nervousness. And that one second he turned in and planted a seed. And I stand before you here today you know, some 20 plus, 25, 26 years later, telling you about Jesus Christ and the forgiveness that is found in him. I'm now the crazy Jesus guy, is what I'm saying. <laughs> it's come full circle around, man. And I guess my point is this. You never know what God can do when you share the gospel of Jesus Christ with someone. It's not our job to save people. It's God's job to save. It's our job to bring the message. And we, he will not know till glory that that kid he talked to that day in the parking lot, that God saw fit uh, to call him the ministry. You just never know what your witnessing might do and the fruit that it produces. I believe as Christians this. I believe we should have fruit of our words, praising Jesus for what he has done for us. I believe we should have fruit of our works. If we're going to tell people Jesus has done great things for us, we should do great things for other people. I believe fruit of our wealth. We can have fruit that are abounds to your account. Give cheerfully, generously, and faithfully. And I believe we can have fruit in our witnessing as we go and share Christ with the lost and dying world. So I ask you this this morning. What's your tree look like? Does it just look good from a distance? Are you here this morning with leaves and no fruit. That's not what I want for me. I bet it's not what I want for you. And I know it's not what God wants for Baptist Temple. So my challenge this morning is this. Let us be a fruit-bearing people. I know this wasn't a salvation message. I know I didn't talk a lot about the salvation plan. But, I, but I'm convinced I need to do this every time, that if you're here this morning, you just need to understand this one thing, that Jesus loves you. And before you can bear fruit, you must be grounded in him. Jesus loves you. He came to earth, born of a virgin, lived a perfect and sinless life. He went to the cross, and there he shed his blood for your sins and mine. He was that sacrifice we talked about earlier. They buried him in a tomb, and three days later he rose again from the grave. And one day he is returning for his children. And if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, I'll tell you what, I, I testify to this. The best decision I ever made was when I trusted Christ as my Savior. And he changed my life here on earth, and he promises me an eternal life in heaven. Our musicians are coming. I'm going to ask you to stand this morning.